What's up? And welcome in to another edition of the Sacramento State Hornets Stingers Up football podcast. I am Jason Ross. Thank you so much for being here for another edition. And wow, do we have a big show for you this week here on the podcast. We are going to recap the thrilling win last week as the Hornet train keeps rolling 6 and 0 oh, up in Cheney on the Inferno, the Red Field last week as the Hornets improved to 6 and 0 oh, beating Eastern Washington. We'll recap that. We'll look ahead to the monster game Saturday night. Two top 10 teams, Sacramento State and Montana. We thought they'd both be ranked higher. Maybe not the Hornets, but certainly Montana, but they lost. So we'll kind of update that playoff or that picture in the rankings and what it could do for the playoffs as well. And a couple of special guests to join us today. One of the uh, great Hornet kickers of all time, currently still a Hornet, Kyle Sinkowski. We sit down and check in with Kyle on his great season and what he hopes to do the rest of the year and after this season as a Hornet. And another longtime Hornet, Darren Arbett, played at Sacramento State, coached at Sacramento State, did radio sidelines for us as well for years, currently is the television analyst for Sacramento State football and has been a widely and highly successful coach in Arena Football League. So he is going to join us and give his perspective as a proud alum and a current analyst watching what this program has become and watching what they're doing each and every week. Darren Arbett will join us as well. So let's go. Let's get started. Let's start with a recap of last Saturday's game. The Hornets going into a spot where Eastern Washington just doesn't lose. They are great on the red field. They were a team that we knew and we kind of warned this is a better football team than their record. Their schedule had been brutal. They felt like they needed to win out. So this was the desperate team that Sacramento State was going against. But the Hornets were locked in, laser focused, got off to a great start. And Asher O'Hara got the party started. O'Hara from the gun. It's third and goal. O'Hara gets the snap. He'll keep it. He goes into the end zone. Touchdown, Hornets. On the ninth play of the drive, Sacramento State scores first. This is what they do so well, and they now lead 6 to nothing. So 7 nothing early, Sacramento State with the offense getting the job done, but get early contributions on the defensive side from the Hornets, too. So third down and long. Hornets would love to get another stop and get the ball back because their offense rolled in that first series. All runs for a touchdown there was a pass play that was a interference on Pierre Williams or against Pierre Williams back to throw is talking to pressure coming throws over the middle intercepted that's Mather at the 20 takes it to the 15 down to the 10 keeps it alive touchdown Sacramento State Mather picked it off at the 20 yard line his first as a Hornet takes it the distance and Sacramento State has advanced their lead to 13 to nothing So the defense makes it a two-score lead. The Hornets have been superb in first quarters, just dominating their opponents. 14-0 felt good. 21-0 was even better, especially this play, which ended up being in SportsCenter's top 10 at number four, kind of fitting for number four, Cameron Scadaboo. Back to throw is Dunaway. Now throws out to the boundary. It's caught by Scadaboo. Scadaboo one-on-one. Oh, goes airborne right over the defense. Spins down the sideline. Keeps the play alive. And he goes inside the pylon. Touchdown! Wow! Cameron Scadaboo does it all. So 21-0. The homecoming crowd in Cheney at Roos Field probably couldn't believe what had happened. Personally, I couldn't either. I know I've seen the Hornets hit teams with a blitz, but it was 21-0 like that, and it was feeling like It might be a play or two from this game being over. Well, how quickly that would change. The Hornets, for the first time this season, were hit by a surge, a quick surge, a couple of quick scores, and then Eastern Washington would come all the way back. First and 10 at the 15-yard line. Hornets lead by eight, 13 straight points by Eastern. It's an end around. No, they're going to keep it. Scooting to the 10. The Hornets aren't even there. What a play by Eastern Washington. Hand off to the near side on a receiver. Reverse. They fake the end around, and the Hornets bit. They take it 15 yards, and the Eagles have now scored 19 straight points. So they would get the two-point conversion. The game was tied at 21. The first time this season, the Hornets, other than 0-0, have been in a game that was tied. After they scored and established the lead, no one has been able to come back and tie them. Well, Eastern had done that. Well, and we've said this many times about Sacramento State, their response this year has been so good. Now, it took a couple of scores to get them to respond because they had a turnover as well that led to one of those points, uh, one of those touchdowns for Eastern Washington. But they would uh, get in the end zone again, courtesy of Asher O'Hara. 
So now we got second goal and goal. Hornets go tempo again. O'Hara fields the snap. He'll keep it. He'll go airborne. He flies through the air and gets into the end zone. Touchdown, Sacramento State. Hornets reestablish the lead. All right, so back up seven at this point, closing in on halftime, and then the Hornets get that critical two-score separation at the break. So they go back to Dunaway at quarterback after the timeout. Change the formation. Three to the left, one to the right on third down and goal. Scadaboo goes in motion, emptying the backfield. Over the middle, wide open, caught. It's Martin. Martin goes low. He's in. Touchdown, Sacramento State. He caught it about the three, went low, and just kind of found a little seam there, Steve, to get the ball across the goal line on an 11-yard touchdown. So Jake Dunaway finding Marshall Martin. And now the Hornets have a 31-21 halftime lead. So feeling better, they had a 21-0 run. Eastern Washington had a 21-0 run. Right now the Hornets are working on 14 straight points. Why not? Let's have the game's third straight 21-0 run. This one again by the Hornets. And it's the third time in the end zone on the ground for Asher O'Hara. First and goal Hornets. They'll spot the ball at the five. And Asher O'Hara back in. He already has two rushing touchdowns. Scadaboo on his right hip. Martin goes in motion. Hornets lead by 14. Still third quarter. Snap comes into O'Hara. He keeps it. Darts to the right. O'Hara on a sprint. Cuts back to the left. Lost the defender and gets into the end zone. Touchdown, Sacramento State. So 42-21 at that point. Eastern certainly wouldn't go away. They would get a touchdown. Kyle Sinkowski would bomb a field goal. And so the Hornets were feeling pretty good. And then they would tack on one more touchdown. Another 300-yard rushing day. Hornets quickly get to the line of scrimmage. They bring in Dunaway. Dunaway to, throws it out to the boundary. It's caught. There's Scadaboo. And Scadaboo powers in. Touchdown, Hornets. Actually, that was Parker no, Clayton. Was Parker Excuse Clayton. me. Parker Clayton with the catch and grab. Eight yards. Touchdown, Hornets. My apologies on that call to Parker Clayton. Um, great catch, great run after the catch. He gets into the end zone, and that would be the final scoring of the day. And all that would be left would be the closing seconds to wrap up another Hornet win. Sacramento State is doing unprecedented things. They have won their 14th straight regular season game. Coach Troy Taylor is now 19-1 and versus Big Sky teams. An incredible 10-0 and on the road, and this team is on in the top five and moving up with a convincing 52-28 to 28 victory. The 6-0 and start matches the best in school history, the best at the FCS level, and this is absolutely amazing to watch. Well, you heard in the description, moving on up, yes, officially Sacramento State is ranked the highest they have ever been in school history. In the coaches' poll, they are number three. In the media poll, they are number two, and there's some great jockeying for position in the top of the rankings for whatever that's worth. Um, it's exciting. It's great to see that number, but I know the goals are still there for the Hornets to win yet another Big Sky Championship, win a playoff game or two or multiples, and certainly chase a championship. That's the goal. That's the quest. That's what they're tra- are targeting. And so to move up to number two is great. South Dakota State is number one. Montana State's up there. Weber State is up there. North Dakota State, one of the perennial powers, has two losses now, but they're up there. Idaho has moved up high after their win over Montana. Montana's still in the top 10. The Big Sky is loaded. The Missouri Valley Football Conference is loaded. And uh, the Sacramento State Hornets should be proud to be one of those teams, one of those elite teams up near the top. Now, one of their elite players that's having just another banner season, someone this team can rely on, Coach Taylor has full trust in, it's this guy, Kyle Sinkowski. Kyle Sinkowski, 7 of 9. This year, they're going to spot this at the 26, so it's a 36-yarder to try to make it a 45-28 to lead for the Hornets. More importantly, a three-score advantage. Campos the snapper, stuts the holder, ball placed down. Sinkowski drives it up. Oh, he got it. Danny signaled that one early. It's good. Three more points for Kyle Sinkowski, and the Hornets now lead 45-28. to That was big. All right, so we're here with... Uh, Senior kicker Kyle Sinkowski. First off, Kyle, congratulations on the uh, the recent honor of Special Teams Player of the Week from the Big Sky. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. I'm kind of excited about it, but yeah. Well, let's uh, let's start with your background. How did you uh, did you grow up growing uh, playing sports? Kind of kind of fill us in and how your activities started being a, a athlete. Yeah. So I started off. Um, I mean, there's like a picture of me ice skating at like the age of two. Um, so ice skating was kind of popular up in like Bellingham. There's like one little ice rink. Um, and then I would just be playing with my older brother, Keith, like just kicking the soccer ball on in the backyard, you know, and and uh, it just kind of grew from there. Like we always had like a 
like a little pop-up soccer net or something like that that I'd be playing with um, and my mom would always be like pushing us to go outside and play not be in the house that much so that's kind of like where the sports background came from and then I always saw my brother like we were six years apart and so I, I went to his hockey games before I started sports and his soccer games you know and, and I had to like kind of funny story I'd have to like wear my soccer uniforms that I would like get from the store um, to his games so I felt like I was an actual <laughs> soccer player even though I wasn't I wasn't even like kindergarten yet and yeah. so um, I always just like wanted to be involved in sports and, and play and then I just got like addicted to it like kindergarten I started playing soccer hockey and um, I think I started basketball when I was in like second grade you know and every, every time I played a new sport I just kept getting more and more addicted to each sport so and then it just kind of kept growing throughout high school and you know and then I just kind of got into kicking through my, like my dad and my brother did it a little bit as well so that's kind of where it took off from so I'm interested in uh, growing up in the great northwest too that you didn't stick with hockey how, how much fun was hockey <laughs> hockey hockey might have been uh, like my favorite sport to play honestly like um it's like it's one of those sports that not everybody kind of gets the chance to play. Like when I tell people here on campus that I played hockey growing up, they're like, what? they're like, we've never even been to an ice rink. And yeah. I was like, I was in an ice rink every single Saturday of my whole life growing up. So, so uh, it was definitely like a blessing to play. It was, it's definitely one of those sports that it's like, it's a little bit more expensive to play, but it, it just, it's, it's so fun just being out on the ice and hanging out with like all your pals and yeah. all that. So. So when obviously soccer translate very well into into kicking, when did football and field goal kicking and that kind of become part of your DNA? <laughs> so it, it started off pretty young because I I knew like I knew my dad kicked a little bit and he kicked out like a junior college and he has like this videotape of him like he won a truck uh, kicking in like the kingdom for, uh, there was like a wow. little competition so I know he kicked footballs and then my brother like he wanted to kind of kick footballs in high school and I was still really young like I didn't even play tackle football yet and so I was just like I was just bored so I was going out on weekdays in the summer and weekends and uh, and I was just watching them kick and I just had like a little peewee ball and I would just go kick on the other end of the field and like I was I was kind of like oh yeah this is kind of similar to soccer you know and um and then my dad was like, yeah, maybe maybe once you start kicking, we'll teach you how to do, like, kickoffs. Because obviously, as, like, a young kid, you don't, you don't really do, like, PATs or anything much like that. But uh, by the time I was able to start tackle football, I was actually able to hit a couple PATs and maybe, like, 25 yarders. So it was still really short. But, um, like, all my teammates thought it was super cool because, like, nobody else in the conference uh, could, like, kick PATs. So we were getting, like, two points. And they were only getting, like, one point for their, their run plays or whatever. So... Um, it, was, it was just super fun because like the, my friends were like hyping me up to do it and and so that's kind of where it started around like fourth grade and then it just kind of took off from there I'm now having the visual of your dad showing you and your brother the videotape how often was he showing you hey look I made this kick in the kingdom it seemed <laughs> it seemed like every year it was oh this is my 10 year anniversary since mm-hmm. this happened and this is my 15 year and then, then it turned into 16, 17, yeah. 18 years so it, I, I saw that I've seen the film maybe probably 20 times now so <laughs> but uh it's just kind of cool to kind of see like what like kind of developed from sure. from from that yeah my dad kind of like passing it down to my brother and then to me so that's cool so obviously you go to jc before you get to sac state how did you become a hornet which kind of coach was looking at you or how did you how did you land here yeah so i actually knew uh two of the coaches for a long time so out of high school uh coach cherokee was uh the special teams coordinator at eastern and he was recruiting me there. Um, and then LaPan, he he was at the University of Utah, and he kind of reached out to me um, right at the end of my senior year before I graduated. And I went to a kicking camp, and I competed against, uh, like, Matt Gay of the Rams. Wow. And it was me and him going back and forth, and, and I won a couple last-man standings. He won a couple last-man standings. And then it was just me and him, and the coaches were kind of just focused on us. And, and uh, he eventually beat me out. And, he kind of got the job at Utah, and I was kind of like, where do I, where do I go from here, you know? Um, and I had, a, I had a couple offers, but they were walk-ons, and it kind of it was going to cost, like, a lot of money to go there. So I decided to go JUCO route, knowing it would be, like, a little bit cheaper, um, just kind of prove myself, show that I, I can get good grades, and uh, and that I can, I can perform at the college level. So maybe I could get that scholarship offer or something that was, like, a little bit cheaper. And then I went to Boise, 
Mm-hmm. And um, I, I wasn't like a huge fan of it. It was kind of like, I felt like it was a little bit of a rush process. Um, and so I entered the transfer portal and LaPan was probably the first person to reach out to me about like two, three days going into the portal. And so I already had that four year kind of connection with him. Um, and I've known him for a long time. And then I met the staff and I was like, oh, like more familiar faces. Like I've heard of Taylor, Coach Taylor before. I've, I know, I've known Cherokee for four or five years at that point. So it, it just felt like the right place for me to come because I already knew everybody. So um, it was a pretty quick decision when LePan offered me to come here. So. And now that you're here, besides the football, just on campus, Sacramento, Northern California, what are your what are your thoughts of, of the city and the school and all that? Yeah, well, I, I love I love the city because it's it's so big. There's so much to do, and in Blaine, there's like five thousand people. There's there's the water, and then there's nothing else. There's there's good food there, but there's not a whole ton to do there. And I mean, like here, you can go bowling. There's a ton of good food. You can you can go do all sorts of things. Go karts golf like I'm a huge golfer and so I golf pretty much every week Um, and there's just so much to do so I'm pretty active uh, like in Sacramento throughout the week yeah we've talked about your golfing on the on the broadcast what's your favorite course in town um any that'll take you I guess yeah yeah (laughs) yeah any that'll take me I'm a huge fan of uh Ansel Hoffman that's a tricky one to play kind of lines the fairways with the trees trees, yeah Yeah, stay out of the trees or you're gonna shoot high so that's kind of that's kind of my been, that's kind of been my favorite course so far. I played a couple of nicer ones, like I played Edgewood and Tahoe. That wow. that was that was really nice, yeah. and uh, I played like Apple Mountain was beautiful as well. Yeah. So, that, but those are so far away. Yeah. But any, um, I don't know. Maybe there's similarities in golf to mm-hmm. kicking because I mean, we've all done it where we have a terrible golf shot and it's hard to not take that with you to the next shot. If you have missed kick, you got to move on. I, I know you're more yeah. accustomed. Are there any similarities to that? Um, yeah, and and even with like the motion of a golf shot's pretty similar, mm-hmm. similar to kicking. Kind of like uh, like the hip rotation and not getting just like if your hips come through and then your hands are stuck behind. It's it's sort of like kicking. Like if your hips don't get through, your legs kind of like legging behind. And then just yeah, the mental aspect of like say you hit a bad shot in golf, then it's like okay, like just reset it, forget it. Like that didn't happen because if you do, you're just gonna keep shooting bad. Yeah. And, uh, and like field goals, if I, if I do miss one, I'm like, okay, I just got to completely forget that and just focus on this next kick because that's, that's the only thing that matters. You guys make it look amazingly easy. I know it's not. Kind of take us through the process. You hit a couple last week at Eastern Washington. Um, what's your mindset moments before snap? I know the snap's important to hold all of it, line protection, but kind of what are you thinking pre-kick? Yeah, so I, uh, I, have, I have a ton of trust in – and my snapper and my holder and the whole line, um, I know they're going to block their hardest and and they don't get a shout out like they deserve. Um, and they're just taking it really on the teeth every every single snap. And then I trust that that AJ um, is just going to keep doing his thing like he's done all season. And, and Ho- Connor, he's he's just been like really amazing at holding. So for me, all I'm thinking is, okay, I just got to make sure my steps are back. At the, at the perfect distance that I like it. My steps are over at the perfect distance that I like it, and I'm comfortable pre-snap. And then I, I try to think about really nothing. All I'm thinking about is, okay, I'm going to go off of Connor's hands, and he's going to get the ball down. I'm just going to see the sweet spot and kick it. And I've done it so much where it's it's just muscle memory, so I, I don't have to think as much when, uh, when I'm kicking, which is kind of helpful. Um, but just having so much trust in those guys, I'm able to clear my mind and just – and just go through a motion that I've done so much in my life. Because those, or you three, really can work so much together separate from practice, is that part of why the switch was from Abel to Con? I mean, you guys can do your reps constantly, and Abel obviously was yeah. more than capable of this, yeah. but the switch seems to have worked well. Yeah, it was, um, I think this, the switch came after, like, we, we got a ton of reps in with Abel during fall camp, and and I trusted him as well, and it was just it was just the fact that, in, like, in pregame, um, he has to do his stuff mm-hmm. as being, like, a DB, and... Uh, and he has to go work with like Cherokee and the safeties, but then it's like with Connor, he's doing his punting thing, and I can go get twenty reps in with him, get comfortable in the game. Where they, able, I think I got like maybe five reps pre-game, which is not what I'm used to. Um, so it, it was kind of like a weird, funky first game. Like I didn't know how it was gonna go, you know. Um, but yeah, which that's I can I can work with him on the sideline. I can work with him. Um, like he comes over to my house a lot, and we just work like like just snaps and stuff like that, and just getting the ball down. Um, so just just being able to get work with those guys like whenever we need it is is a huge help. 
Yeah. As far as uh, what's your comfort, I know Coach ultimately trusts you for sure, um, and you've given him great results. Do you ever say, hey, Coach, I can hit from X amount in these conditions in this place, or is there communication there if need be? Um, yeah, I mean, we do so much charting throughout the year on Tuesdays and Thursdays that, that he kind of knows where my range is, and, and during pre-practice, he comes and stands out and kind of watches me hit balls because on Saturday, uh, your legs are a little bit fresher. You can hit the ball a little bit further, so... We, like, lift Sunday and Tuesday, so our legs aren't as fresh. So me hitting, like, a 54-yarder on Tuesday might mean I'm hitting, uh, like, a 58-yarder on game day. So the the range kind of expands a little bit. Um, And he he has so much, like, data and tracked about me from where where we kick from. Like, oh, you might be 80% from 40 to 45. You might be... It might drop two percent from fifty to fifty-five, um, and so it's def- they definitely trust me. Like I think they would feel comfortable throwing me out there for like fifty-six, fifty-seven. Like if it's like an end of the half kind of thing, they're like, okay, we know he's going to give it a chance. We know that what he's done in the games, he's more than likely probably going to make it. Mm-hmm. Um, it's just being in those opportunities. We haven't we haven't had a yeah. whole lot of situations as well because our our offense is like a machine <laughs> with scoring. Yeah. So. Are you getting tired kicking PATs? <laughs> yeah, a little bit, you know. <laughs> so, selfishly, you want to kick the field goal sometimes. But yeah. um, for the better of the team, you know, um, it's it's nice to score touchdowns yeah. as well. And also kicking a kick an extra point to start off the games a lot easier to ease into it than going out there and kicking a 50-yard field goal. And then – so I, I don't mind how much we're scoring. And obviously I'd like a couple more, a couple more field goals. But uh, – I know the opportunities are going to come, especially if we make like a deep run in the playoffs this year with how good our team is. Have you, I'm sure you've done this, everybody's tried this, I'm sure at some point, like no one's out there, you're not doing snap hold, maybe it's just a kicking tee. Mm-hmm. What's the farthest you've you've ever made, a, the longest field goal you've ever made with no rush, none of that? Yeah, so. yeah. I, I've, made from, I've made from 65 before wow. um, off the sticks and I've hit plenty from like 60 to 63-ish mm-hmm. like over this, this past summer and past summers before that, but um I think 65 is the furthest that I've gotten off the stick so far. So, Well, you mentioned it earlier. Hopefully there's a lot more football left and, and yeah. playoff football. Let's hope for you guys as well. Uh, what's next for you? What What would you like to do after the season's done? You know, I, I try not to think about it too much and, and just take it day by day. But, you know, I'd love to get like a, a look at the NFL level, at least like um, like a camp invite. And, and maybe it's not the NFL. Maybe it's maybe it's the CFL. Maybe it's like one of these new leagues that's popping up, like the XFL, the USFL. You know, just to kind of get a shot and kind of keep pursuing like this dream that I've loved so much. Um, but like the great thing is like you're a college athlete, but there's also there's also school. So I have my degree to fall back on to. So if none of that works out, maybe. I, I might go back to school, maybe not do do something with uh, sports psychology or something like that. That's, that's kind of been something I've inter- been uh, interested in. So, when you watch an NFL game, we all watch the same thing. But are you watching the kicker probably differently than? I mean, are you like really focusing on technique and different things on and evaluating them when they kick? Yeah, yeah. I <laughs> um, so on like Mondays, like Thursday night football, um, college game days, like. Connor Stats, he always comes over to my house and, and we watch the games and and we're like it's like it's like third and long and we get excited because we're like oh yeah <laughs> punt our field goal you know so we get excited because we get to kind of compare ourselves to those guys and um, we kind of get to see their techniques and everybody's so different um, like Justin C- Tucker kicks the ball way different than Jason Myers kicks the ball with Seattle you know so just to kind of see the differences but also the similarities and try to like implement that um and and see what the pros are doing so good and try to try to implement that into my form a little bit to help elevate my game it's just kind of it's kind of big so i try to tune out a little bit of the other games and what else is going on you know but um yeah those those guys those guys i love to watch on sunday yeah i gotta ask you too about you got the greatest uh seat to watch your team i mean you're on the sideline (laughs) Uh, I've called these games a long time, and what you guys have done for the last couple of years is amazing. Wh- why is it working? Offense, defense, special teams. What do you see that makes this team so good? I think it's I think it's the fact that that guys aren't selfish on this team. I mean, it starts off. Coach Taylor talks a lot about about Jake and Ash. Like QBs can kind of be like prima donnas a little bit, and and those guys are are selfless and they share reps, and you never hear anything about it. Um, and then that just trickles down to the rest of our team you know you look at our wide receivers like our two wide receivers get in a lot our three wide receivers get in a lot and everybody's making plays and 
and uh, everybody would like the ball, you know, but uh, we just have like a bunch of selfless guys that are just want the best for the team. Um, and I think we're able to feed off of that and we've had a ton of success because we can share the ball and, and do a whole bunch of different stuff yeah. on offense, defense, and special teams. Well, you're a big part of that too. It's been fun watching you. I hope there's a lot more football for you this year and in years to come. And you kick it straight and you hit them straight, I guess, on the golf course too. <laughs> so we wish you uh, best of luck and keep up the good work. Thank you. Thank you. All right, my thanks to Kyle Sinkowski for joining us here on the podcast. And as we mentioned in the beginning, wanted to catch up with uh, with a guy that's really always been close to this program, and that's Darren Arbet. Darren played as a Sacramento State Hornet. He coached in this program. He worked the radio sidelines, like we mentioned before, with us, with Steve and I, uh, years back. And then currently works with Dave Lewis on the television side for the home games that you get to see on TV. Unfortunately, this week you won't see Darren and Dave because it's on ESPN2, though that in and of itself is is very, very exciting. But I had a chance to catch up with Darren Arbet earlier in the week, and I can tell you he is fired up about this Hornet program. Darren, how are you? I'm doing awesome, Jason. Thanks for having me. Well, uh, I'm going to start this almost like, um, and I don't know, once you're a player and a coach, maybe you always kind of stay in that lane, but I'm going to ask you as a Hornet alum, like what's going on right now? Besides the coaching angle, and I'm sure you watch it through a coaching lens a little bit, just has to make you proud of this this program. You know, I'm so excited uh, what's going on uh, in Sacramento State right now. Coach Taylor is doing a tremendous job, and everyone's excited. Um, when you guys go on the road, I go over to different Hornet, former Hornet players or coaches' houses, and it's just interesting how – this team has turned us all into fans and just the way we watch the game and rooting for them. It's awesome. Well, so now let me ask you that as a former player and a coach here and still coaching now, how, how has he done that? I'm not that surprised that he's been successful, but pretty much from day one, Darren, this team has turned it around and it's just getting better and better. How, how in your mind has he done this? Uh, the players, he has a great eye for players. I mean, the Cameron Scadaboos, the uh, Elijah, Al Tolliver's, uh, Marcus Fulchers, Jake Dunaway. And what he's doing with Asher O'Hara just goes against everything from the coaching standpoint because they usually say if you have two, that means you don't have one. But Jason, he really has two quarterbacks. Yeah, and he hasn't hesitated from that. I remember even going into camp this year, you know, it kind of hit a few people by surprise at about week four, maybe it was a year ago, then they went all in. I said, oh, coach, is it kind of secret this year? That Are you going to play both? He's like, oh, no secret. We're playing both. And um, so now everybody knows there's no more ele- element of surprise. But, Darren, you're right. It it still works every week. And and, and I praise Coach Osborne, mm-hmm. the development receivers. I mean, you look at Jarrett Gibson – great player at St. Mary's High School in Stockton, didn't play his senior year because he got injured. Coach Taylor still went with him. Pierre Williams, Parker Clayton got a scholarship late, and Coach Osborne has done a tremendous job developing those players, not only catching the football, but they block really well downfield. Yeah, I'm really impressed with that part of the offense. And the fact that, you know – I think there there can be a combo of having ego in a sense, but sometimes that's a negative word. I think these guys are confident. I think they believe they're good, but it's not in the sense where the ego gets out of control because the two quarterbacks like each other and appreciate each other's success. Pierre Williams has been an all-conference, all-world type receiver, but if he catches two passes and blocks effectively, he's still a part of the win, and I think they've got so many guys buying in, and as a coach, that's probably really difficult to do. It really is. And he has everyone buying into it. Even me, I was on the air, and Dave Lewis mentioned this Montana game that's coming up. And I said, hey, you know Coach Taylor doesn't want us to look ahead. It's one play at a time, one day at a time. And and it was kind of funny. And and Dave and I had a good laugh about it during the commercial. He says, wow, he even had you bought into a coach. I said, everybody has, Dave. Yeah, it is amazing. And I, I've had people ask me, and you would know better from the coaching realm and knowing Coach Taylor, how to even describe him. I think he's super competitive. Obviously, he's a brilliant offensive mind, but yet can mix that all in without this edge to him. I mean, there's a competitor, certainly, but he's not an over-the-top, in-your-face kind of coach, but yet, like we said, kind of has everybody 
looking at, at him for the the leadership, and yet the results are obviously there. I, I'm just, how would you describe what Coach Taylor has done uh, him as a as a coach? He's he's very innovative, uh, and I already mentioned the talent. The one I did forget was Marshall Martin, mm-hmm. running back. Who he has him at tight end. He's very athletic with the, all the skill positions, and Coach Richardson. I mean, the development from game one last year to the end of the season with that offensive line was just amazing. So I would just say the development of players there, and Troy is just so innovative in what he does offensively. He has no problem. We talked about it on the air. I know you talked about it, you know, playing with three quarterbacks on the field at a time and you know, had six or seven plays ready to go. Mm-hmm. It's just so many things, the way his mind thinks on how to beat a defense. It's, uh, it's it's great to see, and I'm learning a lot just calling the games on TV. And I think it's not only just the two quarterbacks sprinkling in that and how that makes it work. I think his ability to go tempo, to downshift and slow it down, uh, I don't think he's predictable at all. Their conditioning is great. I mean, I really feel like he's always at least one step ahead of the defensive coordinator. No doubt. Uh, and speaking of de- defensive coordinator, I mean, Coach Taylor's great, but, I mean, Andy Thompson is, mm-hmm. is one of the best that I've, I've seen in a while. The players love him. They play hard for him. Parents like him. He's, uh, he's, al- he's always asking questions anything you see but like I told him I said coach I think you're covering everything you can cover and more he's great yeah I agree with you and he's he's a little bit different he's he's the high energy guy on the sidelines and you know watching this team certainly no team is perfect there's always room to improve I know they've given up some bigger pass pass plays and maybe they don't have the same kind of pass rush that they've had maybe in the last couple of years whether it was an Obina or Erickson that was pretty prolific at getting to the quarterback but uh, you know, Darren, you I, I'm a little surprised that without this massive pass rush that the defense has still been this effective. But he's eight deep, so they're fresh. Mm-hmm. Uh, Nagai, I think he can play uh, the day away. He's he's a good one as well. Uh, Roscoe has been great. Pasholo's played solid, moving to that outside with that size. So it's just a different, more pocket collapse pressure on the quarterback instead of that guy that can just get to him. Jeff Stanley's been good. Hardeman's been great. Not plays really well. And I really like Brock Mather at that linebacker spot from where Hawkins was. He stepped in and he's just done a tremendous job along with Armand Bailey uh, just being the leader of that defense. And what can you say about uh, Marte Mapu? Mm -hmm. Just a stud. I mean, really an anchor piece to that defense as far as uh, special teams another element that's very important but it feels like a weapon for Sacramento State they've got good coverage teams a good punter and then Kyle Sinkowski is is so locked in having a brilliant season that you know as a coach I know you know that if you've got all the elements going you you, you, you got to feel really good yeah he's money uh <laughs> Kyle, that uh, still field goals he's money there uh kicks the ball nicely gets it out there and uh, I, I think they have an all-around football team, and that's something Coach Taylor has had every year since he's come to Sac State. It's just an all-around team. Guys are going to step up. Prince Washington has played well. Caleb Nelson has that good height for a cornerback. He's playing well. And I like how physical he is. Mm-hmm. Cameron Bouchard is stepping up. Ian Moore is playing out of his mind right now. So, Juno is playing out of his mind. Just a lot of guys. When you can rotate like that, Jason, and and keep guys fresh, it, it, it's a good it's a good situation for coach. How about the what this means now for the community? I mean, Sacramento State has been around a long time in the football program. You know it. You played there. You've also been a a, a coach here back uh, years ago and a part of the program. Always have always stayed connected to it. Uh, this is the best success they've had in, in as far as number of years consecutively here since they moved to FCS. What do you think this can do to this region that some would say, well, Sacramento State's always kind of been a sleeping giant, yet maybe it's not the greatest college football town amongst college football towns out there. So what do you think this kind of success can do for Sacramento? 
I'll tell you, Coach uh, Taylor's first year, I wasn't doing TV, and I got invited for homecoming, and we were out in the parking lot, a lot of old hornets and barbecuing, and and we said, oh, the game's getting ready to start. And usually a Sac State game, you know, you, you walk right in with your ticket. And I walked up there, and, you know, you got the hand in the chest, and the person is pointing at the line, and the line was all the way to the street to get in the game. And I'm, I looked at Mike Black, an old teammate of mine, I go, hey, man, th- this is real now. He goes, Darren, this guy, he's turned it around, man. It's, <laughs> I mean – it's amazing, and just the tailgating in the parking lot, and something you said. It, it's real football now. Yeah. It really is. It's something to go on Saturdays. Yeah, and this one, I mean, in particular. I, I know. I wish you guys were able to be on, but it's also an honor to be on ESPN two. Um, and it's Montana. I've traditionally one of the great programs in the Big Sky. Two top ten teams to see the Hornets now at number two. I mean, this is just uncharted uh, waters here but it's such a thrill um what do you think about saturday's game with with number seven montana and number two hornets you know montana's a good football team uh i i think uh that win against south dakota what was a big win for them uh, uh indiana state they had a big win and then they ran it to a team that i'm calling the sleeper in the league and that's mm. idaho and I can't say I was surprised, Jason, because you look at Idaho as four and two, and their two losses is by seven points to Washington State, and they lost to Indiana by by a few touchdowns. So it, they're a tough football team. So Montana had their hands full and they got beat, but <clears throat> they're coming in here. They're they're angry, they're wounded. So, but I like the Hornets. You know, Troy always has them ready to play. Uh, he's always prepared, and I think it's going to be a great game, and I'm glad ESPN2 is, is uh, showing this game and we can get some national exposure because, uh, quite frankly, we deserve it. Yeah, I think you're right, and I know you guys, you and Dave Lewis, will be back in the booth the next week, so two straight weeks at home with that Idaho team that you called a sleeper. They'll be here in the schedule. You've got these two in a row. I mean, I know Coach will say one at a time, but then Weber and – uh, still the causeway to come. Portland State in there as well. A- a- as much work as they've done, man, this it's hard, this league. just to, you got to stay focused and locked in each week because the big sky, I, I feel like anybody can get you. Anybody can. Uh, it- it- it's-, it's a tough conference. I mean, you look at that Montana-Idaho State game and, and-, and you go, well, wow, Idaho State lost 28-20. to You would have said, they would have gave up 50 points that game. Mm-hmm. So they there and they, they played Montana tight uh, at home. And I mean, in, in, in uh, Pocatello. So any, any day, any team can win. Yep. It's what makes it fun. And it's fun that the Hornets are on the right side of, of almost all of that. I know for you, Darren, as a, a former Hornet, as a coach with the program, radio sidelines, a television analyst, and uh, just a football fan, this has got to be a thrill for you. And by the way, uh, we should give you a shout out. Congrats on the new gig. You're going to be back coaching again. Uh, I hope that doesn't mean we're losing you on the in the booth anytime soon. No, no. I I told them. I told uh, when they hired me at Sac State, the only way I'm going to leave here, they're going to have to police escort me out, and I'm going to be. <laughs> kidding. I'm a Hornet. I bleed green. Like you said, I played there, I coached there, I did the sideline, I did TV. Heck, I probably swept the the, <laughs> the, the track off and cleaned the seats. I'll do anything to be a part of whatever the Hornets are doing. Well, we know uh, they've got a big fan in you. We're fans of you as well. We look forward to seeing you um, next Saturday back in the booth doing your, your television duties. Darren, thank you so much. And uh, I'm, I know I'm enjoying the heck out of this ride. I'm sure you are too. Loving it. I Every day, I whether it's Coach Plumtree or mm-hmm. uh, one of those players, we talk about it. We're really excited about what's going on in Sac State and anything we can do to help Coach Taylor, we're on board. I know Jerry Hayflick is doing a lot of things over with the school, so we just want to help him and, and help those young men. Awesome. Thank you, Darren. Okay, thank you, Jason. Thank you to Darren Arbet. Now let's look ahead to what we got this weekend. Sacramento State and Montana. As a benchmark program in the Big Sky, it's been Montana. Montana has been the team 
that set a standard that Eastern Washington has chased, Weber State, UC Davis, Montana State, Sacramento State now, NAU, whoever, everybody in the program has tried to build themselves up to what Montana has been. They, surprisingly enough, have not been the same team as far as the power of the conference. They ran off a stretch where they dominated the conference. They won 12 Big Sky championships in a row from 1998 to 2009. What's hard to believe is that's the last time they've won the Big Sky championship. Now, they've been a factor just about every year, and they still could be a factor this year. They did just lose last week, stunned at home by Idaho. So that makes this weekend's game for number 7-ranked Montana critical if they want a shot at winning the Big Sky Conference. I don't think it's going to happen with two losses. One loss may not be may not work, but you still have a chance with one loss and knowing that they still play a couple of teams that they could dictate the terms of the deal, but they can't lose this week if you're Montana and you want to try to win the conference. If you're the Hornets, there was a time where just beating Montana was the end-all, be-all. Now they've done it. They did it back in 2019, year one with Troy Taylor, part of a 7-1 and one Big Sky year and a Big Sky championship year for the Hornets. Then in 2021, last year, they backed it up, went 8-0. That means they had to beat Montana, and they did it, and they did it on the road for the first time in school history. Fourth down and 16. Here we go. Hornet defense. They need to keep Montana shy of the 49. They have to cross midfield. It's fourth and 16. Do they bring the heat? Do they get the pressure? Four will come. Brown back to throw on fourth and long. He is sacked. He is sacked. And the Hornets are going to get the victory. Killian Roscoe comes up with the sack. And for the first time in school history, the Hornets just have to take a knee. And they're going to win in Missoula, Montana. If there was any way to express the joy of this, I would spit it out. But this is priceless. So what does this week have in store? I don't know. More drama, you got to believe. You've got the number three offense in the nation in the Hornets, the number three defense in the Montana Grizzlies. It should feature the speed of the Hornets versus the size of Montana. Montana has a loss coming off of last week. The Hornets are 6-0. and They've won 14 straight regular season games. They're the only team in any level of FBS or FCS that has not trailed at any point this year. And the school in school history, they have never been 7-0. and That's what's on the line this week for the Hornets. And more importantly, trying to stay perfect there, trying to stay perfect in conference and keep those other teams that are still undefeated in conference um, chasing them, right? I mean, you've got Montana State and Weber State both undefeated in conference. Oh, by the way, they play on Saturday. And then Idaho. Uh, still perfect in conference, and the Hornets are going to play them a week from Saturday on homecoming at Hornet Stadium. So things are still in front of the Hornets. The week after that, they get Weber. They really do control their own destiny. The only team they have no impact on is Montana State. Uh, that's the only team they don't play as far as that's in, near the top here. So when you're thinking about this weekend from a Hornets perspective, of course you want the Hornets to beat Montana but I think you might want Weber State to beat Montana State because you'd like to see the Bobcats have a loss. I know that would be scary to keep Weber undefeated, but the Hornets play them in a couple of weeks, and I just like the fact that they could control their own destiny in that situation. But the the reality is the Hornets have to lock in on their own situation, have their best performance, limit turnovers, and let that offense go. It should be a return of Marcus Fulcher, who was out last week uh, with an injury that he had the week before, didn't make the road trip. That should help. Scadaboo was coming off just another unreal week, but it looked like he was fatigued and tired getting his 200 yards on the ground. And uh, find the areas that they can exploit. You know, Troy Taylor will have those windows of opportunity for this offense. Andy Thompson going against his former team. Uh, there's a lot of angles and a lot of storylines. ESPN2, 8 o'clock game. Uh, in the Sacramento region, what's unfortunate, I think there's going to be a great crowd at the game Saturday, and we encourage everybody to get tickets, get them early, get out there early, tailgate, just enjoy the atmosphere. But the Sacramento Republic locally, we're happy for them, but they've got a home playoff game Saturday. And the Kings have their second regular season game of the year. So you're going to have, I don't know, fifteen to 17,000 at the Kings game and another five to 6,000 at the Republic game. So there's a high demand for the sports fan in Sacramento, but I expect a great crowd Saturday. Look forward to it, and uh, hopefully we get to see more great football from the Sacramento State football team. 
My thanks to Kyle Sinkowski. My thanks to Darren Arbett. My thanks to all of you that hopefully check out this podcast each and every week. Tell a friend, tell a hornet out there that we are here and you can uh, get a new podcast each and every week. Next week, we're back to preview Homecoming with Idaho, recap Montana, and uh, see where the Hornets are after this week as well. So have a great week. Enjoy the game on Saturday. Thank you so much for listening to another edition of the Sacramento State Hornet Football Stingers Up podcast. I'm Jason Ross. We appreciate you. We'll talk to you soon. See ya.